Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Carolyn, who is going to deliver our startup cafe. So please give her a warm welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me today. I was really excited to come back. The other part of that story was I was really looking for an excuse to come back to go to Papa Dell's. <laughs> so I got there last night after I went to the wrong place. They, oh, no. uh, they moved, so they've been in a new location, I guess, for three years now. But the good thing is that it tasted just as good as it did 30 years ago. So <laughs> I'll give you a little bit of background just about myself and how I kind of fell into being an entrepreneur. It was not planned at all. So I graduated in 1987 um, with a degree in uh, genetics and development at that time. And I think now it is molecular and cellular biology. So I graduated in December, a little bit early, and my uh, big plan at that point was to get married. I got married three weeks later and I didn't have a plan. Moved back to Columbus, Ohio, where my husband, who's a mechanical engineer out of Illinois, um, I took a job at uh, the Tell Memorial Institute. So Sunday, drive back to Columbus. Um, Monday, first day in Columbus. I'm going to be a housewife because I came from a very conservative um, household. My dad worked for IBM for uh, 45 years, same place for 45 years. So first day as a housewife, lasted all of four hours, and I went crazy. Uh, signed up for Kelly Temporary Agencies, anything. I've got to go do something. So our first day of uh, Kelly Temporary Agency, they put me in a bank, to, and the bank president had me writing thank you notes for his Christmas presents. So that was a nightmare. Called Kelly, said I can't do that. <laughs> Next day, they sent me to a neurology practice to file charts. Okay, well, I can do that. So 20 years later, I was still in the neurology practice. I became the practice administrator. We had the largest practice in Columbus, Ohio. Our practice focused on laparoscopic surgery. So the senior partner in this practice and I, after 20 years, we really were burned out by that time, decided to start a company. Uh, the problem that he faced every day in surgery was condensation on the lens of the laparoscope. So we set out to figure out how to solve this problem. Both still employed in our urology practice. Um, eventually staying up all night trying to start a startup and have a day job at the same time took its toll. And uh, that's when I quit my day job. And we started minimally invasive devices. So entrepreneur at 40 with two small kids. I mean, what could possibly go wrong at that point? <laughs> so our problem that we set out to solve, loss of visualization in laparoscopic surgery. So if you're familiar with laparoscopic surgery at all, an operating suite is actually very cool because the staff have a lot of gowning on. The abdomen, obviously, is very warm and humid, so just the natural process is that the lens will fog. In addition to fog on the lens, you're using, uh, you're using electricity in the abdomen, either as a cautery or harmonic scalpel, that creates a plume of debris coming up on the lens. So we went through you know, how, how, can you solve it? how can you keep lens, the lens clear? Our first idea was to create a cap that you put on the end of a lens that has some inherent problems like what do you do when it falls off? Um, but the idea there was that we could use some of the existing energy on the field and convert some of the light that's coming through the scope to heat a surface and prevent fog from forming on the, on the lens. Okay, so that, that would solve part of the problem, but it wouldn't solve the whole problem. So we made a decision we were going to try to actually keep the lens clean. So what we actually came up with, another obvious one there is maybe a wiper blade going across, because that's, that's something that you can, you can associate with 
you know, your everyday life. You've got a, a wiper on your windshield, wipe, you know, on your car windshield. Again, small pieces falling off, falling off, and just the mechanics of actually being able to do that on a distal end. Maybe not as pragmatic. The solution that we came up with was a sheath that fits over the scope. And it has five lumens that go around the scope. We divert a little bit of the anhydrous carbon dioxide that's used to inflate the abdomen. So you blow in dry gas to create this operating space. Blowing it down these uh, conduits at different velocities creates a vortex in front of the lens. So the dry gas, just by virtue of the fact that it's dry, is preventing condensation from falling. It doesn't need to be warm, it just needs to be dry. But that turbulent air force in front of the lens prevents the plume from coming up on the lens. So we had a complete solution, except if you had something really gunky come up, like blood spray up onto the lens. And there's no way that the, that air force is going to be strong enough to convert solid or fluids coming up. So made another, uh, another addition in one of our conduits flowed um, a surfactant. So we have a biocompatible surfactant that on demand you can flush over the lens. Now we have a complete product. So that whole process took us 10 years just from our idea to the time that we got into the uh, market internationally. It's a, it's a long process for medical devices between the regulatory process, um, but the big thing in the middle was the reiterative process. Um, we started out with um, contract engineering because we couldn't afford to hire our own engineers. Once we brought in our first series of institutional money about um, uh, four years in, then we were able to bring in our own engineering uh, facility. Uh, so that whole process was about $38 million for us. Our guidance was to, um, to create a direct sales force and from our, from our board of directors, that um, is an extremely expensive way to go about selling. So when I was thinking about what I wish I would have had when I started out, uh, I wish I would have had resources like are available here. We were not affiliated with the university um, when we were coming up this, we were leaving a, a private hospital to do this. We didn't have an incubator per se um, to the extent that you do. Uh, it was a, a very basic incubator. We had, um, we had office space and we had some shared conference rooms. But that's not, um, that, that did not provide us guidance on looking at the big picture. So what would have been the most helpful for us is to have someone who could have kind of given us the whole outlay of the process? What do you what do you need to envision in the long term? So, for instance, sales. You don't need a sales team when you first start a company, but you do need to have the insight to understand what aspects of the product that you're developing are going to impact sales. Like, for instance, packaging. Um, the engineers came up with some wonderfully robust packaging, but that really wasn't acceptable, it turned out, in the long run for the, the operating room. So, resources, mentors, near peers, having seen someone who's done that ahead would have been, would have been really helpful. Two big items for us, um, legal counsel, or IP, we went through five different IP firms. Um, again, we were in a, an area that was not a big tech area, so we had kind of general IP counsel that was not necessarily versed in medical devices. Um, once institutional money came in, they had recommendations for from some very helpful uh, IP attorneys. So that was that's something that we did 
figure out, well, that appropriate sales guidance from the beginning, that was our stumbling. That was probably our biggest stumbling block. So to look at the lessons that we learned along the way, uh, if we distill it down to critical inflection points of being able to create a product that works and that you can manufacture and technically provides what you say it's going to do, that one we, we, we did well. Sales, adapt, sales, the biggest inflection point there is whether or not the product that you just made that works and does exactly what you said it's going to do is actually going to be adopted. Um, we struggled, we struggled with the sales adoption um, in that we had some problems with um, kind of scope creep. I was just describing all of the things that we put into our product ultimately. Um, that increases the complexity of manufacturing it. It also uh, increases um, user ad adaptability and whether they want to. Uh, want to use what you've got. The main categories of lessons that we learned is um, four things. Voice of customer, intellectual property, building a team, but then um, sales. The voice of customer is, um, is critical and something that we didn't really realize early on. The um, my co-founder was a surgeon, and so surgeons, if you're if you're familiar with them, they know everything, and that makes the voice of customer actually very difficult. And as an entrepreneur, it's your baby, and this is your project that you came up with. So it's it can be very difficult to actually really listen to what. Um, your customer feedback is, or your potential customer feedback is. Um, programs like iCorp are very instrumental in helping you with that importance of getting out, talking to the customer, and really asking the right questions, too. I mean, we had a tendency to actually approach it more like sales, like trying to convince you that you have this problem, and wouldn't it be great if you had the solution, as opposed to what would you do if you had an instrument like this? Or what are you experiencing when you are in the operating room? So that leads into the next one about really spending time with the customers. Actually get out into the field. As, a, as an inventor, it was incredibly important to hear firsthand what somebody was saying, as, as, long, as, you could, as long as I could actually listen to what they were saying. It's important from the beginning through the end. It's important when it comes to the product uh, design and what are you going to create? What is the need that's actually out there? Um, and are you addressing that need? As opposed to something that maybe is a kind of a pet project. I'm passionate about this thing and I want to solve this thing. That's great. But in terms of something that's going to be commercially viable and widely accepted and adopted, it needs to be something that's actually fitting a need for what the customer or the stakeholders uh, have. Again, really listening about, listening to their comments, especially when they're negative comments, um, that <coughs> enables you to actually create something that's fitting, um, fitting the need as opposed to what you think they should need. Um, understanding the market, in our case, there are many stakeholders involved in the market. So, you know, in true project management, one of the most important things is identifying all of your stakeholders, engaging with the stakeholders, and keeping them engaged. In medical devices, you've got multiple stakeholders. It's the surgeon is the end user, so she or he is using your instrument in the operating suite. But they're not the ones who are ordering it, paying for it, stocking it. It's not their budget, they're, they're the surgeon. So they, also, they, they know what they want, but you are only getting them as the, as the user. The purchaser, that's a completely different stakeholder, and they have completely different needs, too. The size of our box turned out to be a big issue, that it took up too much shelf space, 
Well, there's only a million ways that they could get to know. The size of the box, the color of the label, um, how, how it had to be stored. Um, all of those things are very important when it comes to <coughs> adoption. The other part of that is the uh, nursing staff uh, in the hospital. So they're actually the ones that are setting it up. If they don't like the way that it opens, they just might not really get on to the, um, the backstand. Or they might not open it until the middle of the case and then the surgeon is so tired of dealing with it that, that she or he is just going to keep, keep going. So truly understanding all of the stakeholders that they're involved in listening to them, again, from the beginning as to what you want, but then also in the iterative process. Never is, well, I would, I guess you never say never, rarely is what you envision the end product going to be actually the end product. And the importance of being, of listening, being able to pivot and change, even if it was something that you didn't really think, um, that is critical to your success. It's always a race against time and money. And you've got to get that, that product that's meeting that need out as quickly as you, as quickly as you can um, with the resources that you have. Intellectual property is a very important <coughs> process. And I'm sure this is something that, that you're all very familiar with. Um, when we engaged with the, uh, the last round of IP attorneys, it was a terrific synergistic ex uh, experience. By keeping in touch with them regularly and keeping them up to date on the improvements that we made. So the improvements were always going to be made because of a problem that was encountered in the operating room or feedback that we got back from users. It was those incremental changes that actually was the strongest IP for us by creating more usable features that you were protecting. That created a stronger IP portfolio would prevent companies from copying what we were doing, a fast follower to be able to enter the market into the, the same place. Uh, and, and as Cynthia and I were talking about, the challenge is that equals opportunities. You're, you're doing this because you got a, a challenging problem and you want to create a solution. An example of how our, our first IP attorney, um, she, after reading everything, decided that, well, actually, there are some other things that look close to this. I just don't think it's even worth you trying to do this. So instead of being like on our team, and looking at creative ways that you could protect something, I mean, her, her reaction was just, oh, yeah, I don't really think so. I don't think we're gonna be able to do that. Um, by having an IP attorney where you sit down, talk about your problems, again, it's a diversity of opinion, too. His point of reference was different than ours. We came up with very strong, uh, very strong IP. Building a team, who you want to be on the roller coaster ride with you, is, is really important. It's, it's people that are going to be supportive um, and be reliable, know what they're getting in for. Um, the diversity of opinion, diversity of experiences were very beneficial for us. Instead of just having one person developing, you know, essentially in a vacuum that you, you have all the answers, being able to actually listen to your teammates, listening to, you know, when we had sales brought up, listening to what they were experiencing in the field. What are the, what are the um, various feedbacks that you're getting? Creating, um, creating that environment where you are supporting each other and adding to each other's thought process. That, that diversity and complementary skill set applies to the service providers also. The attorneys have to, they have to work the way you need them to work. We had, well, we also went through four sets of general counsel attorneys. Um, 
because they would not um, deliver the information in the format that we needed. Give you 93 different things and let you sort out what is the best thing, like in terms of maybe a contract or a licensing agreement, as opposed to giving guidance. Um, we are struggling just to, to keep up without having someone give rational guidance um, that, that made it very distracting for us. Um, but we ended up with counsel that worked the way that we needed to, and that was that made all the difference for us. Communication, I mean, back to project management. Communication amongst your team is critical for um, for the vitality and feeling worthwhile, feeling that you're on the same you're on the same um, the same page, and creating a worthwhile team and worthwhile company. So in terms of sales, um, the temptation is to come up with your product, your baby that you created, and you want to get it out to the marketplace right away, and you want to grow sales, in part because you're running out of money. But it's so important to be measured in the process going out, launching with friendlies, so launching with people that you know that you can go and you don't have to be absolutely perfect, absolutely polished, and you really get that introductory feedback is critical. And to take that information to heart and actually make those re those uh, reiterations. Um, our our biggest mistake was going with uh, a direct sales model. This was a, a disposable device for us, so a very low margin. That does not support a direct sales force. Our board wanted us to do direct sales force, so that's, that's what we did. It turned out that actually a distributor and actually a distributor outside of the U.S. was the best route to go. But we didn't have that information to start with. A distributor model within the U.S. is unusual um, relative to its frequency in, say, in, in Europe. So we didn't have an option to do that here, really, in, in terms of a distributor. But in Europe, um, it's a very common model. Our original instinct was that, that launching in Europe was, or, or anywhere else in the world was going to be very complicated, very expensive, hard to control, hard to actually train people, but it turned out that, that was, it was the opposite. The margins were better to do it um, outside of the U.S. Training actually turned out to be I hate to say it, but it was actually better training foreign people than it was to train the, um, the teams in the U.S. I think part of it was they were, it kind of comes down to an ego thing. The surgeons that we encountered in Europe and the staff in Europe and in India and in Australia, um, they wanted to solve this problem. They saw this tool as something that was really going to help them, and they were they really wanted to embrace that and wanted to learn. So that's part of it. There's a weird thing about surgeons domestically, and since my co-founder was a surgeon, there's this weird animosity that would come out that they don't want another surgeon to make money. And, and it's I know I know that sounds crazy, but it was like it was like really true. Or you'd have them say, oh, well, I thought of that idea. It's like, okay, great, you thought of that idea, but what are you doing? You didn't, you didn't go out to create this. So that was just a, an unexplainable thing that we would not have recognized. But training outside of the U.S., we used Skype. They were so interested in sitting down, and it's very easy, you know, with a picture to go through that, creating... Um, a set of guides that are pictorial and don't rely on, um, you know, on a translation. That was very easy. And then sending large quantities of product all at once, which is a whole lot better than the one-offs to the local, the local or the you know, immediate uh, hospitals. So 
that's the main thing. I wish we had had that guidance to go outside of the U.S. And I think that you had mentioned that, that you're seeing that that is a, a common first approach. Um, if we had figured that out earlier on, that would have been, that would have been a big help. Key opinion leaders, this is something also that our board told us, if you need to go to the key opinion leaders, if this guy uses it, everybody will use it. But never was it so obvious what I just described about a surgeon doesn't want another surgeon to be successful. It's almost like they took pride. We're, we're talking about laparoscopic surgery. It's, it's difficult. You're triangulating instruments inside a little tiny space. It was almost like a badge of honor. If I can do this, you know, I'm the best. And I don't need it. I don't need anybody else to be able to um, make this easier because then maybe they'll do this surgery. Um, so the key opinion leaders were expensive. They were not helpful. It was a myth for us. It, it did not work out that way. Now, I think that that's different in therapeutics, in pharmacologics, and when you're changing a course of treatment or therapy, then perhaps a key opinion leader works out better. In a simple medical device, that wasn't the, that wasn't the right route for us. Hospital access as a little startup is very, very hard. It's become harder to get into operating rooms. The way it's set up, at least in um, the hospitals that we worked with, you had to have an appointment with a single surgeon. If you were caught talking to another surgeon, there was not the one approved, you could be banned from the hospital for a year. That actually happened to us in a hospital outside of Chicago. We couldn't go back for a year. Um, when you're a startup, you can't, you can't have that. The, the presence of the large companies, so in our case it was Ethicon and Covidian, these large companies, they have, they have complete control over the operating room. So that argues to you would, it would be much better if the world worked this way, that you would license your product to a large company because they've got the access to get out there. Um, that's, but that's, that's not the way it worked for us. Oh, this is, I was thinking about the kind of the difference between an inventor and an entrepreneur. So an inventor, okay, we checked that box. We created this really cool device. It works. We can make it reliably. It does what we say it want, we want it to do. An entrepreneur, though, is changing a culture, changing the way something is, is done. And that can be an exponential climb to get to get that change made instead of just just an, uh, just a fix to the to the problem. Okay, For over ten years with not a whole lot of advice, created a very long list of what not to do next time. Yeah. And I already talked about the sales. I would do the sales differently. Um, my company. So when we first started, we did all the things you're supposed to do about assembling a board because we were going to do things right. So in one of our early board meetings, I was giving a report on uh, the activity out in the field. I was running the, the pilot launch. And I made some reference to my company somehow. And I was corrected instantly by the chairman of the board. He was probably 70 years old, um, very distinguished former banker, banker. And he looked at me and said, young lady, this is not your company. This is our company. And it was not our, like, hey, we're in this all together, and yay, let's go, let's work hard. It was, this is our company, these men that are sitting on the other side, and we will tell you how this is going to get done. So that's an overarching theme in startups where you take in venture funds. And we were just talking about this, Bob, about if you can bootstrap it and you can do it on your own, you can maintain control. As soon as you bring in outside funds, other people's money, 
you're beholden to them to an extent, depending on how much they put in, to do things the way that they want things done. In our case, the sales, we had a um, majority stakeholder with an opinion on how to do sales. I had a buddy, he's the vice president of sales, he knows how to do it. So that's that's why we did what we did. You you do what you what you're told to do in, in instances like that where the people who have the money are telling you what to do. <laughs> the last one is and I decided not to show any videos today. The the silly what not to do next time. Again, we're talking about pitching to uh, pitching to the country club crowd. I had this nice reception at one of our country clubs to pitch to our um, local angel group. Again, these are going to be successful businessmen to almost a T. I think there might have been no, there weren't any women at that one. I did. So this is laparoscopic surgery and. You know, the added a picture is worth a thousand words to show what our device does. It is so cool, especially when it gets in blood and you've got to get blood off the lens. So I'm showing the video and I'm watching it and looking at it, and a guy in the front row passed out. <laughs> oh my gosh! And then you know, so I, you know, I still think it's kind of funny. It's like it just must be, you know, kind of, you know, kind of. Uh, easily suggestible. Anyway, I got these notes back from the investors that we thought that it was interesting, but we did not like the presentation. And we just don't think that we're going to be interested in doing that. Because I showed what it did. It's like, okay, so never again do I show videos while people are eating food. <laughs> so I was like, okay, fine. All of that gave me a different perspective for the next time. Around. Besides not showing videos while people are eating, one thing is really just the arm's length. Um, I was asked a lot of the time when I was in the midst of all this, would, would you do this again? Would you do a startup again? And I would typically answer the question I wanted to answer and say, I would not trade this for anything. It didn't really answer, would I do this again? Um, but as it turns out, Yes, I can't stop doing that. Once, once you start, and you, and it's the the constant run around and trying to solve problems and putting out fires all the time. Um, but it gave me, I think, a very healthy perspective because this the company that I'm working with now. It's not my technology. I'm able to be at arm's length and be a little more objective about that. It also gives you that perspective that things just aren't going to turn out like you plan, no matter what that business plan said. You know, that everyone's harping on you've got to have this business plan all laid out. You know, we joked about it. It's like, I want our business plan to say, we don't know what the hell we're going to do, but we're going to try really, really hard. You know, that, that doesn't fly for the, um, for the investor crowd. Uh, talking to the stakeholders, that is the most important thing. Early and often. It's never too early to talk to them. You know, unless you're on slide three and you don't want to show them what your you know what your secret sauce is. It doesn't have to be the it has, doesn't have to be a full disclosure, but it does have to be a utility. Is this interesting? So that you can figure out is this actually going to be um, a, a commercially viable product? Are there enough people who want to use this and who will use this? Building that team, the people that you want on the roller coaster with you that will support you, work hard, aren't afraid to do any of the jobs that you've got. You don't have an IT department. You don't have a sales and marketing department in the first. You're winging it and trying to make things work out. And then don't take things personally. Um, that's hard for me. Um, you don't want anyone to tell you that your baby is ugly, or that you didn't think of the right thing, or that you didn't do it the right way the first time. And that was, um, the surgeons were unrelenting with that. And if there was one thing, you know, I was in a, an operating room. So the normal cadence of laparoscopic surgery is, uh, so to say the hysterectomy, that's a, a two hour case, very common that you will take out the scope 
30 times in that time period to warm the scope, clean the scope. So I mean, just think about that. You know, that's interrupting what you're doing. And if you've gotten into a situation where there's active bleeding, now becomes a really critical thing to get in there and, and to fix that. So that's what they're used to. They're used to taking the scope out very, very frequently. Get in an operating room with a surgeon, and um, he never took it out the whole entire time. So he pointed out at the end, said, "So, what did you think? You never, you never took out the scope." He was like, "Yeah, it happens that way sometimes." It's like, "No, it doesn't. <laughs> this is the first time he never, he never experienced it like that." No, and that's no. I'm just that good of a surgeon. It's like, oh. <laughs> so I can have a little bit of humor about it. So what's next? So that was 10 years. Idea, international distribution in 10 years, it was ultimately acquired by a private equity group. So back to my question, would I, would I do this again? Oh, on some of those bad days, no, I would not have done it again. Um, but the matter of fact is, yes. I, I can't help myself. So now I'm involved with a company that I'm able to utilize my what not to do list next because they did a lot of stuff that I wouldn't have even imagined that I would have done wrong the first time. So I'm back in to fix some of these, um, fix some of these problems, apply what I have seen. So I am in um, a reorganization stage with them and raising money. This is an academic technology that has been in the lab for 20 years, but they haven't gotten um, they haven't gotten successfully created a product or get into the, the market. So in addition to the startup, um, tell you more about the uh, EIR next. So our goal with Enlighten, so Enlighten is uh, Enlighten is a biotech company. We have a antibody fragment that um, is specific to TAG72. Um, that's a tumor antigen glycoprotein, glycoprotein 72. It's present in and unique to adenocarcinoma. Adenocarcinoma is 70% of all solid tumors. So, Talk about addressable market. That's that's a nice that's a nice group to go to go after. They've been working on this in the lab for well in the operating room for um, fifth, over 15 years. We have clinical data that we can show. So the little graphic over here, um, the column here on the left, the. Antibody fragment is labeled with item 123. So intraoperatively, using a gamma camera, you can identify where all of the adenocarcinoma is. Real time, so you're not operating from a CT scan that you saw previously and now you're hoping that you find it. While you're in there, you can, it, it actually is lighting, well, not lighting up, it's, it's like a Geiger, a Geiger counter sense, it's a, a gamma probe. So by removing everything that you can find that is labeled, um, the survival rate after 10 years was doubled. So 45% of everybody that all the tumor was removed uh, was still alive after 10 years, whereas in standard care, where you're just removing what you can see or feel. So a lot of these tumors are, they're like micro deposits that you would not see or feel, and they're left, and they're left behind. That's what happens right now. 22% of them were still alive, so double. The more impressive one is the next column, a five-year survival rate on second look. So second look means it was a recurrence of the tumor. By going in with, um, uh, after they've been injected with the ENL 210, removing everything again, 80% of those patients were still alive after five years. Of a group where ENL 210 was not used, 
none of them were alive. So it's a dramatic improvement in um, patient care. So those were done with the predecessor molecules of mirroring antibody. The current one that they've got now is fully humanized. Um, so that is what we are raising money for to run our phase one, phase two trial. So the other thing that I do, and this is actually how I came um, to be in contact with Laura, is I am the entrepreneur in residence for Ohio State Advance. And if anyone's familiar with Advance, it's an NSF program to promote um, women faculty. So um, ret retention, attraction, and empowerment of, of female faculty. So that's a grant that they got at Ohio State um, eight years ago. The marquee program for us is called Reach for Commercialization. And we have a, a workshop series, and then they have brought me on as um, an EIR uh, specifically for the program. And we've seen a tremendous increase in the number of invention disclosures. So to back up just a little bit, this is very, very early on, way before anyone would go to i -Corp. These women may not even have ideas yet. They don't know they have ideas. So that's kind of what we're looking at is, is to talk to them, learn about what they're doing, and really um, open the uh, awareness and possibilities of how they could uh, further the impact of their research and commercialization being an option for that. Originally, our program was limited just to women in STEM disciplines because it was an NSF grant. We expanded that to um, all female faculty. So our last cohort, we had women from social work, public health, um, art and design, performance art. And what happened was a, a terrific uh, synergy, looking at problems from different perspectives. Um, someone from social work is going to think about something um, from an engineering problem in a very different way. Kind of mimics that that idea of a, of a user. You know, if you're not familiar with this, how would you look at this? How would you think about that? So in our cohort, we have um, also had a. Um, a growth of collaborative partners. We've got a woman from electrical engineering working with um, a faculty in nursing. And they've come up with a wonderful device for um, sudden infant death syndrome. Um, recently, our program's also been used to attract female faculty um, as a recruiting tool, that looking at the, um, the opportunities that we're giving and attracting them to the university. I've got to say, though, it's nothing pales in comparison to what you're able to offer. So I won't let any of the female faculty talk to <laughs> the folks at, at <laughs> Illinois. Um, but creating this cohort model, we're expanding now into our community also. Originally, it's strictly for the university. But um, by bringing in cohorts from industry outside of the university, that will make the um, the interactions richer and the networks stronger. So that's pretty much all. It, that's that's my journey. <laughs> that's what happened. I welcome any questions, any comments. Um, but thanks again for having me here. It's great to it's great to visit, and I'm really looking forward to learning more about um, the resources and the facility that you have. Any questions? I knew Bob would have a question. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Carolyn. That was really interesting. Um, as you went through the struggle of direct sales versus indirect, I'll call it, for lack of a better word, you know, one of the concerns I think one has as a small startup company is, you know, as a direct sales, you're the face of your company. You're talking to people you're trying to sell to. When you put that layer in between, now you wonder what are they really saying? You know, how do you train them? So, what, what kind of challenges did you face with that to make sure that you know your goals, your standards, your principles, your qualities were actually what the customers were hearing? That, that's a, a fabulous question. And that's an ongoing struggle, mm -hmm. and that that was one of the key factors for why um, 
why we're really hesitant to go outside of the U.S. Because then you've got to, beyond just transferring your goals, and your messaging, you've got a language barrier as well. Um, especially in medical devices, when you promote a product that's off-label, you can you are in a whole world of trouble. There are all kinds of regulatory issues with that. So that's it's very very hard. So it becomes very time intensive, spending a lot of time in training, and a lot of time going out into the field with them. Communication is the biggest part there. To especially when you've got a sales force that's not co-located with you. If they're spread out over the, um, over the country, there's a level of disenfranchisement that you don't feel that connection. So that was, that was, a, um, was a big challenge. The way that I worked with that then is, I was the customer service department then. So if anybody had an issue in the field, it came to me not to somebody else. So that was kind of a check and a balance on it. Um, hiring, um, hiring quality people. Um, sometimes, you know, and that's, that's a really hard thing when you don't have a lot of money. You know, unfortunately, this, the caliber of the salespeople that we had, I mean, they would either be very young and just out of school, and this was their first one. And that's that's the route we, we typically went, so they didn't have the experience. By not having the experience, they don't have the call points. Um, so it's a it's a it's a catch-22. Being ultimately responsible for the customer service and the complaints, I think that's the best way that you can kind of retroactively handle that. I would also make uh, direct calls to the hospitals to make sure everything was going okay and then spending time in the field with them and bringing them in for training um, and trying to scare them into not saying what they weren't supposed to say. In, in our case, there wasn't too much of an off-label risk, whereas with some devices, and certainly um, in pharma, there are, are serious off-label risks. So in a sense, you provided quality assurance for your <coughs> distribution, distribution team. Right. Yeah. Right, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah. You mentioned the importance of talking to stakeholders. Uh, so how difficult is it to get time from stakeholders to talk about it? And how do you maximize the questions you ask to get more <coughs> That is a fantastic question. Because, so my stakeholders, surgeons, purchasing, they're all the operating room folks. They do not have access. And they are also, we would joke about it, they're also looking to say no. <laughs> so it's very much of a gatekeeper um, mentality there. So by starting with friendlies, so talk to people at least that would, that would meet with you. So in, in our case, our local hospital where we started, talking to the surgeons that we knew. So we were talking to gynecologists, uh, bariatric and general surgery were the were the three that we would start with. Um, very important is talking to the operating room staff. So whether that is the first assists or the nurses, they're the ones who are really hands on and using it. They're also a good conduit to the surgeons um, by being an intermediary for you. So there's a lot of it's a lot of networking. We would also go to um, trade shows and just talk to nurses. It, we had a whole lot more luck with nurses than talking to surgeons. Now, having said that, when we went on an international route, the surgeons wanted to talk to you. And, it, and they were, it was really interesting because they were more scientifically oriented. They were really interested in how we solved the problem. What, what went into this? And would, would ask us questions as opposed to um, shutting down and not talking to us. But that is, that is an ongoing challenge. And particularly with the, um, the uh, aspect I, I mentioned about access to the operating room. Uh, there, 
very, very careful about letting extraneous people in. So you've got to work every angle that you can. Um, and trying, so also a, a caveat there is the people that you know are less likely to be, to give you the information, the feedback that you need. And it's tempting because it's easier to call Dr. Smith because you know her and keep asking her the same questions. And that's, that's an N of one. You need an N of 100, 500. So asking her then, can you, can you recommend somebody that I could talk to? So it, it is about networking. Utilize it without trying to be a pest because you, know, you do become kind of annoying when you keep uh, utilizing the same people. But that, it's an ongoing challenge and you have to be creative about it. Yeah. So you started out with uh, you and one other person. Yes. And you didn't get money for a significant period of time. How do you build a team when you've got no money? Well, it was a team of two for a long time. Yeah, and then convincing other people that maybe they would like to help you out and maybe you give them equity for that. Um, we, got, um, we got our angel funding within um, uh, just over a year. So then we were able to bring in some. Um, so our first, it was the two of us, the first thing that we added to that was contract manufacturing. So we're paying for services at that point. Um, we didn't hire another person, yeah, for really quite a while because if you don't have money, it's really hard to uh, to encourage people to also quit their day jobs and <laughs> come hang out with you, no matter how nice you are and how good the coffee is. Um, but uh, that's, that's a struggle. And back to the comment about sales is, even when you do have money, how do you how do you get people that are that are really good and quality? And that's where again where networking comes in, and the the the, the access that you have here to a vibrant community, and then also students. Um, that's that's a real um, that's a real benefit. And you know honestly, you know the younger well. Is two ends of the spectrum. I mean, young and you don't know any better, um, and you also really want to work hard, or for those of us, those of us that are now kind of, you know, retired and you, you've got free time to look at it. So our, so for instance, our first, um, our first CFO was a retired person who was interested in doing just a little bit of time and had experience in a startup. So again, it's networking, and I can't stress how important the network is, having not had one, and inventing many costly wheels, um, and going down some wrong paths, um, that's, that's, that's a hard way to do it. So really taking advantage of the networks that you've got um, is, is really important. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that one is really hard. Um, we went through a lot. Well, our, the distributors that we used were international. And what was nice there is my contact then with the distributor was the person who ran the distributor network. So it was, it was giving that responsibility to them to herd his or her cats. So that's an exclusive distributor? Um, for, well, no, they would carry multiple, um, they carried multiple laparoscopic products. So, they, so the key to getting a distributor is they've got to have a similar call point. You, know, you can't send, you can't hope that someone is going to sell your laparoscopic product if they sell spine implants or if they sell hip or they sell gloves or something like that. Um, so having, and that's what made it very hard or even not really possible in the U.S. We didn't have distributor networks um, that had similar call points. Um, 
having someone who is running the distributor network, so you are giving that responsibility to someone, was the most effective way. I couldn't do it as, as one-offs, you know, that I've got a single person as a distributor in a network. I tried that, and that, that didn't work because it's always a competing um, interest for them. Which one are they going to sell? And the one that they're going to sell is the one that's the easiest and has the highest margin. Um, So it required very little um, training. And that's what also made it successful in an international market because you could explain it pictorially and really fairly easily and have that be reproducible. Whereas if it is something that is, you know, if you're talking about like a pacemaker or a hip implant or or something like that that requires specific training. That's a huge time investment for the distributor, and they would absolutely want to be an exclusive. Ours, since it wasn't a highly intensive training for the product, um, lent itself to be in the bag of a distributor, and those we found internationally and really not domestically. Yep. Yes. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So we started out with angel funding, and that's you know that's still the same idea in that you've got a collective of other people's money um, within. Uh, to start very early on, there are all kinds of we were talking about SBIR grants. We have um, in at OSU we have. Um, accelerator funding that's matched funds that the state puts in. I'm sure that there are similar funds here, but those are small amounts and it's early on. Um, another option early on is, you know, is friends and family money. That one is, that's part of the problem I'm trying to fix in the company that I'm in right now, is they're they went to all of their friends, and all of their friends put in a little bit of money. So we've got an explosive cap table with little tiny amounts, and um, that's that's very challenging. So there's there are a lot of different balances on it. Putting in your own money. I mean, I did I put I invested my um, funds into our company, but I did not mortgage my house. Um, it, some people do. Um, that that. That was beyond my, um, my level of comfort. But the resources, being able to talk to people who know what the environment is, who know what the different possibilities are, that's a, a perfect example of why having a network is so important because you don't have to figure it out all on your own. Um, there are pe and so there are, different, there are different mechanisms depending on what, um, what type of technology or what type of industry that you're looking at. Um, having another avenue that we looked at was um, co-development. So that's having an industrial partner come in. You know, but then that has its risks and rewards also. So the bottom line is if you're taking anybody's money, you're losing control to a degree. And it's balancing um, the benefits of that money and the, uh, the responsibilities with that money. For instance, our first institutional investor, our first VC, was out of um, the Bay Area. It turned out to be a fabulous um, relationship, though, because the, the uh, senior partner that came in was really our first true mentor. He had been through the process, and he was able to give us um, some very um, 
relative and important advice. Um, but you hear horror stories of VCs coming in and they get rid of everybody in the company and have somebody else run it. I mean, that, that happens also. So when you are taking institutional money, it's very much of an interview. I mean, you'd, you'd love to be in the position that you're looking at three different funds and say, I'm going to pick you. Typically, it's the other way around. You've just talked to 80 funds and you're hoping for anybody to, to give you money. Um, so it is a real balance. On it's, it's a question of how much control are you willing to give up. If you want all the control, it has to be all of your money. And that's not something that most of us can do. Yes? Um, so you mentioned you were ultimately acquired by the private equity group. At what point were you able to identify your long term goal? Um, and what led up to that determination? That's, a, that's an interesting question. Long term goal was always the company is for sale. <laughs> but, you, but you can't operate that the company is for sale. So ideally, where we would have been, what I would love to have done is license the technology out to a large company early on. In devices, that just doesn't happen um, very often. I think it happens more in pharma because that, that, that pathway is so long and takes so much investment to get that into the marketplace. So even though company was always for sale, and you're always talking to industrial partners, um, both from the perspective of, you know, is this something that's interesting from a commercial standpoint? Is this something that, that would have utility in, you know, in your sales rep's hands? Um, it's always, it's always that they, you hope that they're interested and want to acquire the company. But we had to continue because we weren't acquired when we had just an idea. We had to go to the next level, which is actually starting our own sales. And um, so that sales process then continued with the reiterative process. Um, we had one of the possibilities that we looked at, actually we were very far down the road was um, an IPO. And it's actually going to be an IPO in Australia, which is interesting, but it's a different market in Australia. And they're, um, they're very interested in investments in healthcare. And so that's why the bankers that, um, that we brought on were, were very interested in that. So we spent an entire summer getting ready for an IPO. The prospectus was written. It was being sent to the printer. And the, um, the banker called us literally the day before it was going to go out. We had a change of, of heart. And we're going to go in a different direction now. And that, I mean, that, that happens. You know, it's, it's never done until it's done. It's never done until the check is actually in your bank account. So even though we always had an exit strategy, um, like I said, nothing, nothing turns out exactly like you planned. That business plan of, you know, in five years, we were going to exit to an industrial partner, that, that didn't happen. So in our case, the private equity was not the original plan. That's what happened, because that was the option that we had at that time. But it was always a matter of operating like you're going to be a going concern, like you're going to go the, the whole way. Uh, because if you don't get picked up, you've got to do something. So you keep planning to go to the next step. Yes? Thank you very much for all the very valuable information. Uh, because we have a startup uh, in the Philippines. Oh, great. Uh, they're looking at the uh, Adventist Project. Uh, so I have out of my curiosity, I have no other way to decide, but in case you are invited here, you will be in here. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we, we're we're <laughs> Joking about this, even just from a cathartic standpoint, to say, 
oh my God, you can't believe what I went through today. To have someone say, I know. I, and I, I went through the same thing, you know, but I, I'm still here. You know, I'm like, okay, I made it. Um, it is, it, for just even an, uh, a basic operational standpoint. And that's why I feel so passionate about what I'm doing with um, the women at OSU is there are so many exciting options. Yeah, it is scary. It is really scary. And I'm not going to yeah. sugarcoat that. Yeah. Um, but it's certainly doable. And, and failure is OK, actually. And that's where you learn an awful lot of things. But you gotta have you gotta have someone to help along the way. So I'm passionate about that, about helping others. And so maybe you don't have to invent quite as many wheels as I did. And that's you know that's that's what you want is to be more efficient and successful in getting out and getting your technology into the world because that's what it, it comes down to. You want to help society in whatever form it is, whether. It, is the vaccine is the vaccine animal people um, plants what are, what's your vaccine so get their own vaccine for, so get okay for yeah vaccine. I mean, that's, okay. Okay. That, that's really cool. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like yeah so that's that, it's like an extrapolation of the distributor model how do you how do you go about this that's that's great yeah I'd love to talk I'm, I'm gonna hang around because it's just too cool. Thank you.